Okay, let's uh, let's unpack this. We've got this document. I say 530.pdf. Right, the International Standard on Auditing 530. All about audit sampling. So it looks like we're diving into how auditors decide what to check when they, well, they can't check everything. That's the core idea. Yeah. So our mission today is really to get a handle on these core concepts. Why sampling matters, what auditors need to think about, that kind of thing. Exactly. We have the full standard here. It covers, you know, the objective definitions right through to how you actually do the sampling. Mm -hmm. We'll pull out the crucial bits, the uh, the aha moments, hopefully, mm -hmm. and keep it clear. Avoid the jargon. Sort of a guided tour through the standard. Think of it like that, yes. Yeah. Sifting through to get the key insights for you. Okay, so first things first, what's the main goal here, according to the standard? Well, the objective when using audit sampling is for the auditor to get a... Um, a reasonable basis. Reasonable basis. To draw conclusions about the whole population. Yeah. Just based on the sample they selected. Okay. Like tasting a slice of pie to know about the whole pie. That's a great analogy, actually. Auditors deal with massive amounts of data sometimes. Thousands. Millions of transactions. Easily. So checking every single one. Just not feasible most of the time. Sampling is the practical way to form an opinion. Right. Okay. Let's get some definitions locked down then. These seem pretty fundamental. Starting with uh, audit sampling itself. Okay. The standard defines it as basically applying audit procedures to less than 100% of the items in a population. Less than 100%. Makes sense. But here's the key bit. All the items, the sampling units, have to have a chance of being selected. Ah, okay. So it's not just grabbing the easy ones. Definitely not. It's about getting evidence from that selection to then form a conclusion about the entire population. There has to be a chance for everything to be picked. And that entire population you mentioned, that's the next term, population. Yep. That's the complete set of data that the sample is drawn from. And it's the set the auditor wants to draw conclusions about. So if you're looking at sales, it's all the sales transactions for the year, maybe. Exactly. Or all the customer account balances or whatever set of data is relevant to the specific audit test. Defining that population correctly is crucial. Okay. Now this one sounds important sampling risk. It is very important. Yeah. It's the risk that the auditor's conclusion based just on the sample might be wrong, might be different from the conclusion they'd reach if they actually tested everything in the population using the same procedure. Okay. And this risk can lead to two kinds of mistakes. That's right. Two types of erroneous conclusions. First, you might think controls are working better than they are or that there's no significant error when actually there is. Uh, so you miss something important. Precisely. And that affects audit effectiveness. It's the risk of issuing the wrong opinion, essentially. That sounds like the bigger problem from like an investor's point of view. It generally is, yes. Yeah. Because if a material misstatement slips through because the sample didn't catch it, the financial statements might not be reliable. Right. And the second type of wrong conclusion. Is the opposite. You might think controls aren't working well or that there is a significant error when actually everything's okay. So you do too much work. Basically, yes. This impacts audit efficiency. The auditor might perform extra procedures that weren't strictly necessary. It costs more time and money, but doesn't usually lead to the wrong final opinion on the statements themselves. Okay, got it. Effectiveness versus efficiency. What about anomalous misstatement? Ah, uh, yeah. An anomalous misstatement is an error that's clearly demonstrably not typical of the kinds of errors you'd expect to find in that population. Like a complete one-off, an oddball. Exactly. A freak occurrence, almost. Because it's not representative, you generally wouldn't project it across the whole population like you would other errors. You'd investigate that specific thing separately. Makes sense. And the last definition here, sampling unit. That's simply the individual items that make up the population. So back to the sales example, each individual invoice. Could be, yeah. Or each line item on an invoice, or each customer account or each entry in a ledger. It depends entirely on what the auditor is testing and how they've defined the population. Okay, clear. So moving on to the actual requirements in ISA 530. A big section is sample design, size, and selection of items for testing. Yes, this is fundamental. When designing the sample, the auditor has to consider the purpose of the test. What are they trying to achieve? Right. And they need to look at the characteristics of the population itself. Is it uniform? Highly variable. And that affects the sample size. Absolutely. They need to determine a sample size that's sufficient to reduce that sampling risk we talked about down to an acceptably low level. Okay. Makes sense. More risk needs a bigger sample, generally. Generally, yes. Or a more targeted approach. And crucially, 
the selection method has to give each sampling unit a chance of being picked. So again, not just convenience sampling. Definitely not. All right. It needs to be systematic or random in some way, or at least demonstrably unbiased. Real thought has to go into it. Okay. Then there's performing audit procedures. Seems obvious, but what's the standard getting at? Well, it stresses that the auditor must perform the planned procedures on each item selected. Right. If an item isn't suitable for the test, like, say, a voided check when you're testing payments. You can't test it. Right. So you might need to select a replacement item following specific rules. But if you just can't perform the planned procedure on a selected item for some other reason. Like the document is missing. For example, you can't just ignore it. You generally have to treat that item as a deviation if you're testing controls or a misstatement if you're testing details. Wow. Okay. So you can't just skip the hard ones. That shows the rigor involved. It does. You need to understand why you couldn't test it and what that implies. Next up, nature and cause of deviations and misstatements. So when you do find errors in the sample... I can't just count them. You need to investigate why they occurred. Yeah. What's the nature of the error? What caused it? And how does that affect things? Well, you need to evaluate the possible effect on the purpose of your audit test and potentially on other areas of the audit, too. Ah, so one error might point to a bigger problem elsewhere. It could. And this is where it gets interesting, like you said earlier, if you find a high rate of errors or deviations in your sample. It might mean the whole population has a similar rate of error, a red flag. Exactly. It's potentially indicative of a broader issue. Understanding the why helps assess how widespread it might be. Okay. Then we get to projecting misstatements. Right. If the auditor finds monetary misstatements in the sample, they need to project those findings to the entire population. To estimate the total misstatement in the whole account balance or class of transactions. Precisely. But it's not just a simple multiplication. Like, finding a $100 error in 1% of the sample means a $10,000 error overall. No. Why not? Because it requires professional judgment. You have to consider the nature of the errors, whether they were anomalous, how representative the sample was. It's an estimation process. Okay, so judgment is key there. And finally, evaluating the results of audit sampling. This is the wrap-up for the sampling exercise. The auditor steps back and evaluates everything. Did the sample provide enough evidence? Essentially, yes. Did it provide a reasonable basis for the conclusions about the population? They look at the results of the procedures, the nature and cause of any errors found, and that projection of misstatements we just discussed. And decide if they're comfortable with the conclusion based on the sample. Exactly. Or if they need to do more work, perhaps test a larger sample, or perform different procedures. Got it. Now, you mentioned the standard also has application and other explanatory material. Yes, which provides more context and detail. For instance, on sample design, it reiterates that sampling lets the auditor draw conclusions about the whole population from a part of it. And it talks about different approaches. Right. It distinguishes between statistical and non-statistical sampling. What's the difference there? Statistical sampling has specific characteristics, random selection of the sample items, and using probability theory to evaluate the results, including measuring that sampling risk we talked about. So more mathematical. You could say that. It provides a quantitative measure of sampling risk. Non-statistical sampling is any approach that doesn't have both those characteristics. It relies more on judgment. It relies heavily on the auditor's professional judgment to design the sample, select items, and evaluate the results. The standard permits both approaches, depending on the circumstances. One isn't inherently better, but statistical sampling offers that explicit measurement of risk. Interesting. Okay. There are also appendices. Appendix 1 talks about stratification and valuated selection. What's stratification? Stratification means dividing the population into subpopulations, or strata. Each stratum contains items with similar characteristics, like, say, grouping transactions by monetary value. Why do that? It can make the audit much more efficient if you have a population with a few very large items and many small ones. Like large customer balances versus small ones. Exactly. Yeah. You might want to test all the large items or a bigger proportion of them and then sample from the smaller ones. Stratification allows you to focus your effort where the risk or potential impact is greatest. Okay. Targeted sampling and valuated selection. That's a specific type of statistical sampling, often called monetary unit sampling or MUS. The idea is that individual dollars are the sampling units, not necessarily the physical transaction or balance. How does that work? 
It means items with larger monetary values have a proportionally higher chance of being selected in the sample. Ah, so a $10,000 invoice is more likely to be picked than a $100 invoice. Much more likely, yes. Yeah. It's very effective, particularly when the auditor is primarily concerned about overstatements. Those high-dollar items get more attention. Makes sense. Appendices 2 and 3 give examples of factors influencing sample size. They do. One for tests of controls and one for tests of details. They're illustrative tables. What sort of factors? Things like how much risk the auditor assesses for that area. Higher risk, bigger sample? Generally. Also, the tolerable rate of deviation for controls, or tolerable misstatement for details, basically. How much error the auditor can accept. If you can tolerate less error, you need a bigger sample to find it. Exactly. And also, the desired level of assurance. How confident does the auditor need to be? More confidence usually requires a larger sample. So it shows that trade-off between risk, precision, confidence, and sample size. Precisely. It highlights that sample size isn't just plucked out of the air. It's a calculated decision based on these factors. A higher, tolerable misstatement, for instance, would generally allow for a smaller sample. It's a balancing act. Okay. And finally, Appendix 4 outlines different sample selection methods. Right, the practical ways to actually pick the items. Like, well, there's random selection using random number generators or tables. Truly random. Okay. Systematic selection, picking every nth item after a random start, like every 50th invoice. Efficient. Can be, but you have to watch out for patterns in the data that might align with your selection interval. Right. What else? Monetary unit sampling, which we touched on, that value-weighted approach. Then there's haphazard selection. Haphazard sounds a bit random. It aims to be like a random selection, but without a formal structured technique. The auditor selects items trying to avoid any predictable pattern or bias. It relies heavily on the auditor being careful not to subconsciously favor certain items. Tricky. Can be. And lastly, block selection. Choosing a block of consecutive items, like all transactions in the first week of July. Is that common? The standard generally considers it inappropriate for audit sampling, because a single block is rarely representative of the entire population or period. You might test a block for a very specific reason, but not usually for projecting results. Okay, that's a lot to cover. So wrapping this up, what's the big takeaway from this deep dive into ISA 530? I think the main thing is that audit sampling is a really crucial technique. It allows auditors to give an opinion on vast amounts of data without looking at everything. But it's not simple. Not at all. Mm. It involves careful planning, understanding risk, knowing the population, choosing the right method, and applying significant professional judgment. It's this blend of science and art almost. Balancing getting enough evidence with being efficient. Exactly that balance. Providing that reasonable assurance about the financial information relies heavily on getting the sampling right. You know, it's interesting thinking about how these principles apply outside of auditing. How so? With this idea of needing a representative slice to understand a whole pie, we do that all the time, right? Hmm. I suppose we do. Like reading reviews for a product online, that's a sample. How do we judge if it's representative? Or opinion polls before an election, that's all sampling. That's a great point. Assessing the sampling risk in everyday decisions. How reliable is the information I'm getting from this limited subset? Right. Could you use stratification in analyzing customer feedback, focusing on the high value complaints maybe? The standard, it's technical audit stuff, sure, but the underlying concepts about gathering and interpreting partial information, they seem pretty universal when you think about it. How do we make good judgments with incomplete data? That's a fascinating thought to end on. It really makes you think about how we navigate information everywhere, not just in an audit context.